Let's first see the normal blood circulation. The venous blood reaches the right atrium via the superior and the inferior vena cava. For the diagrammatic purpose the superior and the inferior vena cava are shown as a single vessel. During diastole the tricuspid valve opens and the blood reaches the right ventricle. When the right ventricle contracts the blood is pumped into the pulmonary artery. The blood reaches the lungs for oxygenation. The oxygenated blood reaches the left atrium via the pulmonary veins. Mitral valve opens during diastole and the blood reaches the left ventricle. When the left ventricle contracts, the blood is pumped into aorta for the systemic circulation. The oxygen is extracted by the tissue perfused by the branches of aorta. The deoxygenated blood then again reaches the right atrium, via the superior and inferior vena cava. The cycle then repeats. It should be noted that for the ease of understanding, it is showed that blood fills the right atrium first and then it reaches the left atrium. Actually the right and left atrium are filled at the same time and the right and left ventricle contracts in synchrony. Let's see the pathophysiology of atrial septal defect. One can see the defect in the interatrial septum. Usually there is left to right shunt across the atrial septal defect. The left to right shunt is not due to the difference in the atrial pressures. But is due to the difference in the ventricular compliance. The compliance of the ventricle reflects its diastolic pressure. It should be noted that the left ventricular diastolic pressure is about two times as that of right ventricular diastolic pressure. As the right ventricle is more compliant and distensible than the left ventricle, the blood from the left atrial flows to the right atrium across the atrial septal defect. As the patient ages the left ventricle becomes less compliant. Thus the shunt across the defect increases as the patient ages. Patients with systemic hypertension also have less compliant left ventricle, so these patients also have increased shunt across the atrial septal defect. Patient with associated mitral stenosis or regurgitation also have an increased left to right shunt across the defect. Patients with atrial septal defects are usually asymptomatic for several decades. But some point of time they develop symptoms. The usual symptoms are exercise intolerance and recurrent respiratory tract infection due to increased pulmonary blood flow. As the right atrium is volume overloaded, it dilates. Same thing happens to right ventricle and the pulmonary artery. It dilates due to volume overload condition. Since there decreased flow across mitral valve, the left ventricle is of normal or slightly decrease in size. Atrial fibrillation or flutter can occur due to the dilated right atrium. The most important auscultatory finding in atrial septal defect, is wide and fixed, split second heart sound. The second heart sound is wide due to increased flow across the pulmonary valve. This makes the pulmonary valve to close a bit later than normal, that's why second heart sound is wide split. The split is fixed due to constant right ventricular preload both during inspiration and expiration. This is due to the left to right shunt. In chest x-ray, the right atrium and right ventricle are dilated, cardiac apex is formed by the right ventricle. Pulmonary artery is enlarged. There will be plethoric lung fields, that is the pulmonary vascular markings can be seen till the periphery of the lungs. The aortic knuckle is small due to chronic decrease in the systemic cardiac output. The ECG findings are right axis deviation, incomplete right bundle branch block, due to the hypertrophy of crista supraventricularis. In ostium primum atrial septa defect there is left axis deviation, due to absence of left anterior fascicle. Crochetage sign is notching of the terminal upstroke of the R wave, and it correlates with the size of the defect and implies a greater degree of shunting. It disappears after the defect closure. The indication for the atrial septal defect closure is when the pulmonary blood flow is more than 1.5 times the systemic flow. If the defect is left untreated, the pulmonary vascular resistance increases over time, due to pulmonary artery remodeling to the increased pulmonary blood flow. 
As pulmonary vascular resistance increases, the right ventricle struggles. The patient may develop right heart failure. The patient starts to develop tricuspid regurgitation, due to dilated tricuspid annulus, and due to increased right ventricular afterload, that is increase in pulmonary vascular resistance. Eventually the shunt across the defect decreases. The symptoms due to increased pulmonary blood flow will decrease. But when the pulmonary arterial pressure increases more than the systemic pressure, the shunt gets reversed, that is right to left shunt. The patient develops cyanosis and Eisenmenger syndrome. One of the complications of atrial septal defect with right to left shunt, is paradoxical embolism. That is an embolus which is carried from the venous side of circulation to the arterial side, via the atrial septal defect, with right to left shunt. The clinical manifestations are based on the site of the embolus lodgment. It can cause multi-organ ischemia and infarction. It should be noted that, the atrial septal defect closed in childhood, will have similar survival as the general population.